This morning I called two American historians who recently published a book entitled Rethinking U.S. Power, Domestic Histories of U.S. Foreign Relations. This book was published by Palgrave Macmillan and it can be accessed on the link that I'm going to paste right in the description panel on the upload for this video. This episode was proudly brought to you by Global South Opportunities. If you're looking for a scholarship, if you're looking for a research grant or a fellowship, do not forget to hit the link that is in the description panel on the upload for this video. Global South Opportunities is there to support you all the way with the information that you need and the expert guidance that you need from professionals that are with the organization. Enjoy the show. Gentlemen, thank you very much for making the time. I'm very happy to have you. I'll give you this opportunity to just uh, introduce yourselves, uh, talk about the research that you are doing, uh, the, the courses that you are currently teaching at your respective universities. So I'll actually start with uh, Professor Daniel, then I'll come to you, Professor Mike. Sure. My name is Daniel Bessner. I'm a professor in the University of Washington's uh, Henry and Jackson School of International Studies. I teach on U.S. foreign relations um, and international affairs, primarily history, but also a little contemporary. And um, I'm actually on spring break right now, but I just taught a lecture on um, the history of the U.S. and the world. And next quarter, I'm teaching a seminar on the same topic. Um, so I'm Michael Brennis. I teach uh, history uh, at Yale. I also teach um, co-director of the Grand Strategy Program uh, at Yale, which is a program that uh, recruits students from around the college. Um, we have about 20 students in the program coming from both the college and graduate schools uh, to talk about strategy in broad terms uh, focused on sort of classics of strategy and strategic texts, but also some not so classic texts like Franz Fanon and Martin Luther King, um, which is a, it's, the program is a year long program. Uh, and I teach in that both in the spring and the fall semesters, uh, when I'm not teaching a grand strategy, I also teach like Danny, I teach classes in the U S and the world and U S political history. Um, I write broadly on those topics. Um, and, yeah, that's in both the 20th and 21st century, sort of U.S. in the world and U.S. political history. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So now, what are the core ideas of this book? And uh, what do you consider to be the central argument? So I think the, the book gathers a series of case studies that emphasize the importance of domestic processes, events, and phenomena uh, to the history of U.S. foreign policy and U.S. foreign relations. Um I think it is in response and in dialogue with the dominant strands of literature that have emerged over the last 30 or so years, particularly at elite institutions um, when it comes to analyzing U.S. foreign policy and U.S. foreign relations, um, that you focus on international or transnational phenomena or non-state actors. Uh, and so our, our book uh, it, it learns a lot from that literature. There's work on non-state actors, um, a significant amount of work on non-state actors in our book, but we focus primarily on on a domestic context um, about how these events that are mostly delimited to the United States, even though of course people are traveling traveling abroad, shape U.S. foreign policy and U.S. foreign relations, and and 
in particular, though we do focus on non-state actors, it turns out that a lot of times the, um, the site of influence of non-state actors is the state or state-associated institutions or, or in, uh, meetings and things associated with the state. Um, and so we focus on that. So I think what we're trying to do is, you know, in, in dialectical response to that international and transnational turn, refocus slightly, excuse me, refocus slightly on the domestic context and hopefully reach some sort of concordat, whereas in the future, we'll be able to incorporate the international, the transnational, and the domestic context into a coherent narrative whole that helps better explain the history of U.S. foreign policy, U.S. foreign relations, and to some degree, at least, you can't only um, uh, the U.S. U.S. Uh, actions abroad. Uh, so it, it's not meant as, as sort of a, a denial of previous literature, but really to add to it and, and to encourage scholars to place these various um, let's say sites of, of interaction, the international, transnational, and domestic, in a dialogue with a focus on explicating why things happened and thus delineating causal hierarchies, which things were most important when. Was the international context most important here? Was the domestic context most important here? Was the transnational context most important here? Because I think there's been a tendency in history, broadly speaking, not totally, and I don't want to overstate the case, but to focus less on on delineating specific causality, which is, I think, one of the things that we want to do with our book. And We're trying to create a space for scholars who, uh, like the both of us, have worked on domestic issues, you know, and domestic problems, but in a context of sort of U.S., hegemony and U.S. primacy in the 20th century, create a space for those scholars to kind of enter into the field when um, much of, as Danny said, much of the focus of the field for the past 20, 30 years has been around sort of transnational processes, looking at actors who work outside the state. So it's also kind of a kind of a way to sort of open up um, metaphorical arms, so to speak, and sort of like allow people to kind of come into this space. And, and as Danny said, create a more holistic approach towards understanding the study of U.S. foreign policy um, and bringing the state kind of back in, um, which was a project of political history and political science for quite some time. And I think now U.S. Uh, scholars of U.S. foreign relations, U.S. and the world kind of need to bring the state back in. And by state, we mean the American state and think about what that means again for uh, the future of the field when it's in a state of crisis um, in both sort of professional terms as well as sort of existential terms, um, you know, going forward. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much for that. So now, um, when you say domestic histories of U.S. foreign relations or U.S. foreign policy, what what are some of these examples of these histories that you engage with uh, in the book? Sure. I mean, I, I have a chapter in the book and so does Mike. Um, so I, just to begin, I, I talk about how, for example, a, a consensus was created immediately after World War II that scientists should work for the state and how these institutions were built and how an intellectual ideological consensus was created. And that that's primarily a national phenomena, and it's related directly to the creation of the military intellectual complex, which is itself part of the national security state. Um, other people, like in our volume, Sarah Miller Davenport, focuses, I think, on a great essay on the domestic origins of globalization, how particular domestic phenomena led New York City to, to adopt a, a quote-unquote global city model uh, to help um, to help it survive a fiscal crisis in the 1970s and into the 1980s. Uh, Amanda C. Demmer focuses on uh, a, a, a group that tried to deal with uh, Southeast Asian refugees and, and how a, a mostly domestically organized group helped shape refugee policy. Um, Vivian Chang focuses on international cocoa negotiations and, and how um, and interactions between the global North and global South um, helped shape those policies toward um Coco, uh, Stephen Wartime talks about the difference between isolationism and internationalism. Mike Conkowitz talks about domestic congressional peace politics. Daniel Hummel <laughs> discusses mm -hmm. uh, the domestic sources of uh, why, when did the embassy, the U.S. embassy in, in Israel become such a hot topic of conversation? Um, and Katie O'Connell talks about uh, you know farms and, and how farmers were mobilized for the Cold War. And I don't think I left anyone out, but might correct me if I'm wrong. But so these are just various cases that explore 
again, domestic phenomena and how they shape U.S. foreign relations. Oh, I left Mike's out, so Mike could talk. About this. <laughs> yeah, I, I um, no worries. I mean, yeah, I, I I study sort of political economy of of defense spending in the 1990s, looking at people who uh, in the Clinton administration um, are thinking about conversion, but ultimately not in broad terms, and thinking about the way in which um, at the end of the Cold War, there's a sort of rethinking about what the state should be doing in terms of foreign policy, but that rethinking doesn't lead to a transformation uh, in terms of what foreign policy means. And I would say also just to, again, sort of put up, you know, expand upon what Danny said, it's that we have welcomed in scholars in this in this volume who are looking at, again, the state of people who want a part of the state or want access to the state or looking to mobilize within the state or looking to get something from the state or people who actually, from working within uh, Congress, which are part of the national security state, like Danny's piece, you know, examines sort of, it's a way in which sort of these, all these essays kind of come together, whether they're looking at sort of, you know, Vivian's essay on Coco or Katie's on farmers, you know, all these, all these essays kind of come together around the theme of sort of what ultimately is the role of the American state in terms of creating power and people accessing that power uh, in, again, a, a sort of American century and, and beyond. United States Secretary of State Henry Kissinger once said a very popular quotation that is, you know, very common in <laughs> in most disciplines, history, political science, international relations, and it says the United States does not have permanent friends; it has permanent interests. Um, how how do you relate with this kind of uh, quotation with uh, you know? your work and with the chapters that come out of the book i think i think to i mean to a certain extent that's right you know in the united states i mean every nation has interests any any state has interests you know like to deny that they don't have interests in it's like you, know, you don't have a you wouldn't have a foreign policy right if you if, in, in, if you don't have interests that's just sort of a objective fact that you know has to be understood uh but the united states interests of course you know being what it is and in, in after World War II, those interests um, are multiple, yes, but they're also um, take on various forms in terms of how those interests are pursued and how 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 power is, is wielded, you know, in in the context of foreign policy to to achieve those interests. And so, what we we're trying to do through the book, you know, to to put in the context of what we're doing is sort of look at look at the ways people um actors within the state and beyond again try to uh achieve their own interests you know, from from again american power and american hegemony to either again you know katie's essay is is to secure more profits for their farms and, and to make them um you know continue to continue to produce but also the state has you know having interest to sort of export agri agriculture to to you know food for aid um program in the 1950s and 1960s or whether it's people you know who i look at in my essay which is to people who are looking at um the fact that the united states doesn't have to be the global hege hegemon that it was you know with the fall of communism and rethinking okay like well maybe we can get more concessions from the state in terms of our interests vis-a-vis -vis social welfare and that not that materializing different forms so the united states i think you know and this is sort of the point that 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 danny has raised with fred logoval in their piece which is that the united states um is the preeminent power it's a superpower um in the post-world war ii context and so to understand that i think means you have to understand how power is wielded and therefore how interests are pursued in again state state based and status forms and i think that's what we're trying to do um without rambling on too much if, you know or, or further as we're trying to do uh with the volume and i'll turn it over to danny now yeah i think that's genuinely right i mean and and then this actually raises interesting questions you know when when kissinger says permanent interests whose interests who defined those interests how did those change over time et cetera, et cetera. because that's that it's kind of like um my frustration with a lot of political science literature and policy commentaries, it stops at in the national interest. What the hell does that mean? Whose interest? Blah, 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 blah. And that's why this sort of work could actually help, you know, this domestic focused work could help illuminate, which I think, uh, what I think to be the crucial questions of U.S. foreign policy, both historically and in the future. Now, who will greatly benefit um, if they get their hands on this particular book and why? 
every person on earth, I think, exactly. has much to learn from this book. Um, <laughs> it is, they could get it for the low, low price of $160, <laughs> uh, I think, or 130 now. You can get it 130 uh, on Amazon. Now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, right. But it's evil to use Amazon, Mike. <laughs> Correct. Um, it's true. Uh, even though every single person does it. Exactly. Um, so uh, I think all of humanity really, and if there are, <laughs> is outer space life forms, I think they also <laughs> might benefit from reading this book. I think, you know, ghosts, aliens, monsters, you know, even extra human forms <laughs> will benefit from reading this book. Yeah. I mean, you know, um, we geared this towards, yeah, I mean, we, we both write for broad audiences and we want people to read our stuff. We did not set the price at $160. You know, let's just put that out there. That's, you know, as much as we fought back on that, okay. we lost because the academic publishing industry is a behemoth and doesn't listen to mm. us. Um, mm -hmm. But to to put another point on it, I, mean, say, I would say, you know, we wrote this for the initial purpose behind this was to make something accessible to undergraduates where oh, you yes. can sort of download this you know, download chapters, individual chapters, which you can, you can download individual chapters off um, the Palgrave website, their spring. Is it on website. JSTOR or Project Muse? It probably will be, right? So it will so, be soon, I think, right? Yeah, it has so to be. it has to be, right? So hopefully if you have a university access, mm -hmm. you'll be able to, to get, I think that's the new model, right? The new model is correct. sell a few hard copies, but really we're going to license this as part of Palgrave's offerings, I hope. Um, I don't recall. Yeah. I haven't read the contract, <laughs> oh, but it'll probably be on JSTOR or Project Muse at some point. Yeah, uh -huh. that, that's that's so that's exactly really, yeah, that's exactly right. Uh -huh. um, I don't have anything to add to that. And I think what you know, we hope we hope people. Well, first of all, don't pay one hundred sixty dollars for it. If you want one of our chapters, just send us an email. Our emails are open, you know, <laughs> they're, they're available on Google. Um, but you know. If you read the book, I think, and anyone who does sort of history, I would say political history or formulations history, mm -hmm, there's mm -hmm. cultural history in there, there's it's a, the social history. Um, anyone who reads the book, particularly undergrads, though, I think will come away with a sense of of, of why American power is so important, right? And then uh -huh. sort of de-emphasizing the state is really, hasn't been altogether that productive in terms of understanding the things that we should sort of be interested in again pluralist terms um but i uh, you know the primary audience is undergrads but you know send me i've got we've gotten emails i've gotten emails from graduate students and from just people who follow us on twitter wanting to read our stuff mm -hmm. you know and i think that's really what we're aiming for is mm -hmm. everybody to be able to read it mm -hmm. at the low low price of 160 dollars <laughs> but yeah uh-huh nice nice yeah, I think I think this is enough, gentlemen. Do you, what do you think? Do you have anything that you might want to add? Sounds great. Thank you uh -huh. for having great. us. Uh huh. That's perfect. Thank you so much. All right. I will keep you posted. Have a good day. Take care. Bye. You. Bye.